please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome to Power Breakfast. We are in the Mumbai News Center. I'm Nigel D'Souza and with me is Anisha Jain. Hey Anisha, good morning. Not great going for our markets in the last few trading sessions. Overnight queues as well, not too good, but um, we've seen a 300 point correction from the top yes. on the Nifty. So let's see if uh, we can bounce back at least at some point of time daily. We are hoping for that, but it's not really happening. Well, yes, let's see whether today is the day when it is an end to the correction cycle that we are seeing. But first up, let's run you through the top headlines at this hour. U.S. markets end lower as shares of General Electric slumped for a second straight day. Asia trades cautious amid signs of an oversupply in commodities and uncertainty over the U.S. tax reform. And back home, October trade deficit balloons to its highest levels we have seen in nearly three years. Exports contract by 1% to $23 billion. All the rules apply to everyone unless you can really show that you deserve any relaxation from the rules. So Tesla and Apple haven't been able to show you that they deserve any not, special not, relaxation? Not yet. Not yet. DIPP Secretary Ramesh Abhishek tells CNBC TV18 that Apple and Tesla haven't shown enough commitment to deserve exemptions just yet. Adds that an index on state support to startups will be launched on December 1st. And Sun Farmers' profit is supported by lower tax outflow. Margins recover from multi-quarter lows of 17%. Bank of Baroda reports its lowest slippages in four quarters. The asset quality improves to 11.16%. Gale 2 reports a strong quarter. Profit is boosted by higher <coughs> other income and modestly lower tax rate. Lupin in focus as warning letter becomes public points out repeat observations at multiple sites on account of invalidating OOS results. U.S. drug regulator recommends engaging a qualified consultant to assist in good manufacturing practices for Goa and Indore units. All right, then first up, let's take a quick check on the Asian markets. More or less cautious in the trade. Remember, there was a weak handover from Wall Street. So on the back of that, in fact, we are seeing that those markets are trading more or less mildly in the red. Japan's economy, though, grew for the seventh straight quarter. That's the longest expansion since 2001. So at least the economic data is looking uh, reasonably good, particularly for the Japanese economy. Remember, they have been benefiting from the government fiscal stimulus. Also, uh, massive Bank of uh, Japan monetary easing that's been taking place over the last few quarters. So the economic data is good. But on the back of a weak overnight queues, we're seeing that the Japanese market is seeing a bit of a downtick. But let's pull up the other Asian markets. Let's see what the rest of Asia is doing. It's not looking great, actually, just to kickstart trade. So the Kospi is down in trade. That's down close to around four tenths of a percent. The straits in the Taiwanese index as well have started off on the back foot. And what that would mean is that the SGX Nifty as well is indicating a bit of a flattish, uh, a softish start. So we'll be starting closer towards that 10,150 uh, on the Nifty, remember, because that's in fact the SGX Nifty is aligned to the futures market. But uh, let's get in some opinion from Morgan Stanley on emerging markets and India and China in particular. The two major economies in this part of the world, uh, China, we've been very positive on now for about a year, year and a half, and we've been consistently positive on India. And I think the um, the big difference now versus a couple of years ago is, I think, the susceptibility of regional economies to a big pickup in U.S. rates far lower than it was. Markets have done really well. Um, we've got a couple of dynamics here. We've got synchronized global growth. We call that early. Uh, very good earnings. Uh, low inflation. Outside of the Fed, um, largely accommodative central banks and I actually don't feel positioning is at an extreme so uh, could this continue for a little while longer for sure at some point we are going to have a correction we're in a late cycle US economy at some point it's going to correct a little bit but the biggest risk really in my opinion still comes out of the US Fed you know how quickly will they raise how much will they raise uh, the kind of impact that's going to have on the US uh, is going to impact the rest of the world there's no question 
And on Wall Street, then U.S. stocks fell as shares of General Electric slumped for a second straight day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average declined 30 points at close. The S&P 500 as well declined two tenths of a percent, with energy as the biggest declining sector as oil prices slumped, while the Nasdaq ended three tenths of a percent lower. Now, equities were also pressured by disappointing economic data out of China, which raised concern about the global economy. Slowdown in U.S. tax reform also dampened investor sentiment. The House is likely to vote on tax bill later this week. And Mohamed al -Iryan, the former PIMCO CEO and current chief economic advisor at Allianz, is under consideration by the White House for Federal Reserve Vice Chairman. al would take the seat vacated in October by Stanley Fisher and presumably would be second in command to Jerome Powell. Uh, remember, President Donald Trump has three Fed governorship positions to fill. Well, turning attention to the European market, so there we had all the three frontliners ending in the red. In fact, the big decline was caused by a big decline that we saw in commodity where prices overnight. In fact, commodity stocks were weighing on those markets. The FTSE, though, there's a relative outperformer because it ended more or less flattish in trade. Economic data, though, for Germany looked a little good because we had the GDP that expanded by 0.8%. That was primarily driven by exports as well as investments. On the other hand, UK's inflation numbers came in a tad bit lower than what the street was working with. But a quick check on uh, some of those peripheral indices. Well, we had the Portuguese index. That, uh, you know, ended mildly in the green. It ended with a gain of close on two tenths of a percent. But the other peripheral indices, they did see a bit of a knock in trade. And what really took a hard knock was emerging markets. The Russian index was down close on a percent. The Brazilian index as well was down close on 2.3 percent. So it wasn't a great day for emerging markets. But uh, moving on then, four of the world's top central bankers warn of limits to forward guidance. Fed Chair Janet Yellen, ECB President Mario Draghi, as well as Haruhiko Kuruda of uh, Bank of Japan and Bank of England's Mark Haney, who were present at the European Central Bank's conference, said that they would continue to try to signal their next moves to the market. Steve Leesman wraps up the highlights of the conference with how the forward guidance should work. Yellen saying that price earnings ratios for stocks are at the high end of historical ranges, but saying that the financial stability risk, as judged by the Federal Reserve staff, remains quite moderate. In recent months, we have communicated in the minutes staff's evaluations that asset prices are elevated. That means that price earnings type ratios are at the high end of their historical ranges. We are in a low interest rate environment, and that may be one that's likely to prevail mm -hmm. for a long time. Draghi saying he saw some local cases where asset prices were out of line, but not in general. And is that general idea for dealing with them is regulation, not policy to address those pr price, price changes or those price levels. Also on the podium, Bank of Japan's Governor Kuroda and Bank of England Governor uh, Mark Carney. Uh, Carney sees the, an economic impact from Brexit in terms of incomes and in terms of supply to the overall economy, and that will have an effect on policy. Kuroda saying inflation expectations were slightly picking up in Japan, but the BOJ would continue an accommodative policy. Banks are in different places when it comes to policy. The European Central Bank recently announced it would be reducing its quantitative easing, but it is still expanding its balance sheet. The Bank of England recently raised rates, but it's still also expanding its balance sheet, and both uh, low rates and bigger balance sheets are on tap in Japan. The United States is the only one of the four central banks that is raising interest rates and reducing its balance sheet. Steve Leisman, <laughs> CNBC Business News. Okay, and rating agencies S&P has declared Venezuela in selective default after it failed to make $200 million in payments on two global bond issues by the end of a 30-day grace period on November 12th. The rating agency's action has pushed the cash-trapped South American country and its creditors one step closer to a reckoning of its $150 billion debt load. Okay, turning our attention then to the currency space, the dollar held more or less steady ahead of the U.S. consumer inflation data that's due later today, while the euro remained close to a two-and-a-half-week high. That, in fact, got a boost from the upbeat German economic data.
And in the world of commodities, crude oil prices tumble after the international agency, energy agency, reduced its projection for oil demand for this year and the next year, citing the impact of higher prices. The agency now expects demand to grow by 1.5 million barrels a day this year and 1.3 million barrels a day next year. And from the precious metal space, gold prices gain marginally as weakening US dollar as well as sluggish stock market help pull the precious metal off its one-week lows. Uncertainty over the fate of US tax cut as well prompted some safe haven buying currently uh, gold holding at around $1,282 an ounce. Well, the SJX Nifty is indicating a weakest start in trade today. It's indicating that we could see a downtick of around 30 to around 40 points. But yesterday as well was another weak day of trade. The Nifty slipped below the 10,200 mark. The Sensex ended a tad bit below that 33,000 odd mark. The broader indices, well, they mirrored what the benchmarks did. The mid-cap index closed lower. We had the Nifty Bank as well. That was under some uh, pressure. It's been a, a sharp correction from the recent peak. And I think there's been some lack of institution buying. That's putting pressure on our markets. Anisha, how's trade set up early this morning? Well, the trade setup is looking weak, yes. As you mentioned, yesterday was a day uh, when we saw the market continuing the downtrend as well. The market, as you mentioned earlier, is off around 250-300 points, the recent peak. Uh, it's five out of six sessions that we have seen in the last few days that the markets have closed in the red. Now, you were talking about the weak fund flow picture. Yes, optically, there is a net buy figure when it comes to the FII of close to 2,600-odd crore rupees. But remember, there is a big Infratel deal that is really muddling the data there because that was around a 3,800 crore uh, buy that came from the FIIs. DII as well, net sell, just marginally so. 1.3 crores is the net sell figure actually on the DIIs and cash market. So that also just dampening the mood a bit. In terms of the handoff from the global markets, yes, that is weak as well. Because look at the US equities. All of these key indices actually close in the red. Now there are concerns about global so slowdown given the Chinese economic data was not very strong. There have been concerns about delay in in the U.S. tax reform that is also weighing on the investor sentiment. So that also added to the pressure as far as U.S. market is concerned. In Europe as well, the earnings were a tad bit disappointing, as well as commodities, as you were mentioning, uh, were really sliding and putting pressure on the key stocks and indices there. So Europe as well closed in the red, mostly for the top three um, headline indices there. As far as Asia is concerned, it is mostly a sea of red today. Yes, Japanese economic data regarding the GDP is a tad bit better than what we expected. It is close to a seven uh, quarters high. But if you look at the private consumption, that is what is really deterring the street. And that's the reason that uh, it is holding up in the red down about 180 points as we speak on the Nikkei. That is the first time the private consumption has fallen since 2015. And that's the reason the red on the Japanese screen. The other cues for today, the trade deficit is also a bit disappointing. It is at three years high. The exports have declined after the good performance that we had seen in September. And crude prices, now that is the only cue that is a bit supportive for the Indian markets because they have extended the losses. Uh, the Indian Energy Agency has reduced its projection for oil demand. And that's the reason we are seeing that impact on the oil prices. And that just might impact the stock market today. But overall, VQs and SGX Nifty, as you were mentioning earlier, 30-point downtick initially. Well, we're trying to look for positives in all those uh, data points so that, in fact, we could see a bit of a bounce. Mm. Today, Anish, I'll give you one more data point. You know, the FIs, when we started the series, mm. they had 70% of their positions on the long side, 30% were short. What happened yesterday was we saw again a surge in terms of short positions, and now the FIs have 48% of their positions as short positions. Okay. So the long positions have come down from around 70% to around 52%. Mangalam will join later, he'll give us more on that. Mm. But uh, give us some more uh, cues, I mean, in terms of stocks that we should be looking out for. Well, of course, all the crude related stocks are one thing to watch out for, but other than that, Lupin will be in focus because remember the warning letter for the Goa plant has become public, and the US FDA comments do not sound very good. So Ekta will fill us and on that later, but that should be on the stock. India Bulls Housing Finance sold 10% stake in Oak North Bank that they had uh, purchased in 2015 at a good profit at around 770 crores. That should impact the stock positively. In terms of earnings reaction, Sun Pharma broadly in line with expectations. The profit they supported by lower tax outflow. Not major commentary coming on the hello inspection, the con call as well. Bank of Baroda reports the lowest slippages in four quarters, and that should bode well for the stock. The net interest margin has also expanded both quarter and quarter, as well as year on year. In terms of Gale, it is a weak top line, but better margins and lower taxes what aided profitability there. 
NBCC similar story the top line is a bit disappointing but um, and the margins are better and that is leading to the profit beat there. Lance Capital, now that is a bit of weak performance. Remember the profit growth is very muted uh, owing to a single digit top line growth that we have seen and the higher taxes. Seat revenue is below estimate but margins are better and that's the reason we should see the stock in green today. Corporation Bank reports net loss for the first time in six quarters. That should weigh down on stock. Into account weak numbers as well. Cox & Kings, good set of numbers. The profit up 140%. Venetia Biotech as well. Revenue jump 45%. The margins 30% versus 6%. That should really hold up in the green. Gayatri Projects, good numbers as well. Waterbase margins came at 15.5% versus 6.4%. That should hold up in the green. Shreya Shipping as well, good results. Now, it is the fag end of earnings season, but just a few stocks that might come up with results today. Care Ratings, Sumani Ceramics, TD Power Systems, Universal Cables and Wandela Holidays. These are the stocks that will come out with results today, Nigel. Yeah. Moving on to some macroeconomic data then. Now, the numbers that came for the exports in October have fallen for the first time in many months. The culprits have been the textiles and the exports of gems and jewelry. And thanks to this, the trade deficit has widened to $14 billion, the highest figure in the last three years. Lata Venkatesh is here with the highlights. Lata, what do you make of this number? Yep, uh, $23 billion exports is quite clearly a shocker. Uh, that was because in September we did $28 billion and we thought we had recovered. You know, from all the months in 2017, we have been languishing between 22-23 billion export run rate. We thought, I mean, of course, this was attributed to demonetization and uh, 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 GST. We could not participate in the global recovery, we thought, because of these domestic disruptions. The September number of 28 billion gave us the hope that we have probably overcome that. But now, you know, if you looked at the uh, internals of the export data, two important sectors, ready-made garments and uh, uh, gems and jewellery, as you said, are the ones that have pulled us down. And these are our biggest export uh, uh, categories. Together, they account for over $6 billion. And these are the ones uh, that are also dependent on the supply chain, which could have been anecdotally disrupted uh, by GST. So uh, the question we are now left with is, was September at $28 billion the outlier? And, uh, you know, we are back to our uh, uh, mediocre performance. Or is October an outlier? And we will pick up the September trade by November, December. That only time will tell. But for the moment, we have a worry on our hands on exports. And that has led to a shockingly high trade deficit of 14 billion, which is a multi-year high. Okay, uh, Lata, thanks so much for that. So next month's data point becomes even more important after that trading. But moving on then, startups are flourishing in India's metros. But now the government is working towards enhancing startups in tier two cities. This was revealed by the secretary at the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, Ramesh Abhishek, at the CNBC TV18 Town Hall on the ease of doing business rankings in association with Invest India. When asked about following, uh, about allowing uh, exemptions to Apple as well as Telsa to invest in India, the DIPP secretary made it clear that both those two companies have not made the cut just yet. Actually, what we need to see is those hundreds of millions of young people who want to become entrepreneurs today. Yeah. We need to provide them with the ecosystem and the enablers in the environment, mm. like large number of incubators. The, you know, we are setting up tinkering labs. We need to have seed funding. We need to have marketing support for them. Mm. You know, we need to do all this so that we reach out to tier one, tier two, tier three cities as well. Okay. So I think what we are doing, what the government is doing, is a comprehensive intervention right. in the startup space providing them equity. Now we are going to have a credit guarantee fund. We are providing marketing support. We are connecting them to investors, to our hub. There are a whole lot of interventions. There are laws which are not meant for startups. Mm. So we are trying to change the laws for angel investors, for uh, different types of funding, etc., and the way the companies work. So can we expect something on that front in the budget, sir? Is that going to be a specific recommendation uh, that you make to the finance minister? Just the other day, we had a meeting with uh, Chairman Sebi with 20 angel uh, investor groups in the country okay. about how the angel investor groups can be regulated so that they take advantage of Section 56 of Income Tax Act. So there are a lot of things that we are trying to do. Okay. I mean, not everything can be done in a day, sure. but it's a process and we are working on it. Uh, we welcome all investments in uh, manufacturing, including Tesla. 
Tesla, Apple, everybody is most welcome. I'm glad you brought up yes. Apple on your own. That was going to be my next question to you. Just so. trying to help your TRPs. <laughs> <laughs> so give me a headline, sir. Tesla, Apple. What's the yeah. story? See, uh, we uh, people, whoever wants to come, they have to abide by the rules of the game here. Hmm. So if you want to so import... So no relaxation. So you want to import, obviously you have to pay import duty. You want to retail, your single brand retail, you have to do the 30% uh, local sourcing. So all the rules apply to everyone unless you can really show that you deserve any relaxation from the rules. So Tesla and Apple haven't been able to show you that they deserve any no, special not, not relaxation? Yet. Not yet. We are working on it. <laughs>